So again, for joining today's live webinar, my name is Raquel Rodriguez, the Events Manager here at Security Compass and your host for today's webinar. Before we get started with the actual content, I'd like to just give you a quick overview of Security Compass. For those of you who may not be aware of us until today, Security Compass was founded in 2004 and began with a team of experienced penetration testers. Today we have come far and work with many large enterprises globally to manage their cybersecurity risk through balanced develop automation. We have three key offerings. Our flagship product, SD Elements, enables organizations to manage software security without slowing down development through automation. Our modular role-based e-learning solutions empower organizations to embrace DevSecOps, and our strategic advisory services offer expertise in cloud security, pen testing, and red teaming for a better security posture. Just to quickly go through a few of the housekeeping items, as you may notice, you've all entered the session on mute to reduce background noise. Secondly, a recording of this webinar will be available after today's event, and you will receive an email with a link to the recording. This will also be published to our resources section on our website. Also, we encourage everyone to raise questions. Please submit your questions into the Q&A chat, and we'll make sure to address them during the Q&A session. Lastly, if you would like to follow up with us, or if you have a topic you would like to see covered in a future webinar, please email us at contact at securitycompass.com. For today's webinar, we're going to take a closer look at the intersection of software development and privacy. I'm pleased to be here with Altaz Villani, Director of Research at Security Compass, and Jeff Durrell, Data Protection Officer at Odaseba. Altaz and Jeff, thank you so much for being, with, being here with me today. I know our audience is keen to hear your presentation, so I'll let you take it from here. Great, thanks Raquel, appreciate that. Uh, I'm just going to uh, share my screen here just to kickstart the conversation here. Um, when we normally think and talk about privacy and software development, uh, there's a, a gap that we're seeing in the industry right now. And it's really uh, all about trying to see how we might be able to bridge this gap. Uh, and so I'm just going to uh, quickly put up something here that I would like to uh, kind of share with folks to see what, what we're doing. Uh, this is typical of the kind of uh, diagram that we see when we're talking about DevOps. Typically, we're looking at uh, several areas around software development. So we might have, as an example, um, things related to the coding side of things. And when we, when we look at coding, for example, we're usually looking at some kind of static analysis that we will do. Um, and similarly, when we move uh, further on in the life cycle, we'll get into the build uh, part itself. And in the build, we might go in and uh, conduct some additional security activities there. Uh, and, and so as we kind of go through this, this DevOps uh, infinity symbol that we've got at every stage of the way, what we try to do is try to overlay security activities on this. Given that this is so prevalent in the industry today, the challenge that we have is what does this mean from a privacy standpoint? Where does privacy intersect with, with this discussion here? Uh, we know that, that there are concerns around privacy because we're seeing things happening with GDPR. We've got a lot of regulations that are coming up in the United States. Uh, but if we're going to move at the speed of DevOps, the challenge we've got is developers need to move very, very quickly, really deploying several times a day. And yet at the same time, we've got to inject security and privacy activities into this kind of a flow. So we're looking at a continuous everything kind of model, continuous security, continuous privacy, continuous integration, continuous deployment. And therein lies some of the challenge because historically we found that security and privacy concerns were an add-on or the way that we've been doing security and privacy doesn't really lend itself well to uh, how DevOps works. But we're here to try to bring to the forefront in this discussion today, what it means to inject privacy into this discussion when we're dealing with DevOps. So I'm going to pause here for a moment. I'll hand it over to Jeff, let him share his screen. 
And uh, then we'll continue the discussion from there. So Jeff, you wanna share your screen and, and give us your thoughts as well? Yes, hey, thank you. Can you see my deck? Yep. Okay, great. Altes, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak to you and your audience about this. So it's been very difficult, as everyone knows, to try to accommodate uh, security and now data privacy into software development, uh, simply because the emphasis for business enablement has been an agile approach uh, to as quickly as possible bring software to market for competitive purposes uh, and opportunity purposes. And speed is sometimes the enemy of more uh, careful approach with a lot of constraints. And when you're talking about security and data privacy especially, uh, those can be very complex constraints. So uh, up until now, uh, this past year, there really hasn't been any data privacy framework standards that had been recognized internationally. Uh, there had been ones which were national, there were the developing ones uh, by NIST, uh, the data privacy framework, uh, and there had been some specific data privacy guidance for certain types of application software. But now that we have ISO 27701, which builds upon the information security standard of 27001. Uh, we happen to have auditable controls, which have been recognized internationally, and that's going to be the um, main topic of uh, my discussion here and how to address this, this issue. So optimizing software development data privacy relies upon an effective GRC practices, especially governance. There really isn't a way to automate or use a lot of technology uh, into ensuring data privacy because of the complexity of the way data is used, uh, the way data subject rights have to be protected, informed consent, uh, data subject um, request management, uh, and um, also jurisdictional issues such as data flows that uh, need to be uh, respectful of certain agreements such as the previous uh, US-EU uh, privacy shield when it comes to data flow between the US and EU countries. So governance is where it's really at. So governance requires standards. And, and the old saw, the old joke is, the great thing about standards is everyone has them. In this particular instance, a question might be from a development team, well, why do we need to have standards around this? Adopting data privacy standards provides valuable guidance to assure building personal data protection, safety into software, much akin to adopting building code construction standards that prevent costly casualty losses. So a corollary that a lot of people can identify with is um, the International Building Codes BOCA model that have been used to ensure uh, building safety, building soundness for commercial and residential properties and also National Fire Protection Association uh, requirements uh, to ensure fire safety and construction. Another reason for having standards is failure to adopt them within software design may result in very costly regulatory compliance enforcement actions. Um, everyone knows that there is a myriad of ever increasing international, federal and state data privacy laws and regulatory authorities have been issuing costly penalties. As a very recent uh, example, just this past week or so, the Federal Trade Commission fined a mobile app developer $4 million for alleged uh, COPA violations through an in-app advertising. People may or may not know that uh, COPA is to protect uh, children under age 16 from uh, having their personal data uh, improperly stored and accessed. And um, that was a recent regulatory fine. And also in the case of GDPR, there have been numerous uh, enforcement actions, such as the one from the German Data Protection Authority that fined an organization 14.5 million euros because an application saved data from application applicants without the ability to delete them. And again, um, a lot of this may have really been prevented if there had been an initial discussion 
between business areas and their uh, particular goals of the way data would be used in a new application and uh, the application developers in understanding what the constrictions or constraints might be with the way that data would be used. So here's just an example of international data privacy laws. And, and this is even dated. I think this is uh, a couple of years old, but every couple of months, uh, a country is coming up with a new data privacy um, development that um, nations have to be respectful of, and it can be really quite a challenge. So uh, up until this point, there's been no international data privacy standard with controls that can be independently audited. Um, software development has had some uh, security and privacy standards, uh, but usually they've been limited to a certain type of application type. Uh, developers may be aware of OWASP and um, their top 10 web application security risks and OWASP top 10 web application privacy risks. But again, that's for web applications, not for a broader base um, security development considerations. So up until now, is there an international data privacy standard that can provide software development guidance? Yes, ISO 27701 standards uh, offer that during the software development life cycle. Uh, that had been released at the end of August 2019 and you'll see here that um, one of the GDPR uh, data protection authorities uh, who do investigation and enforcement uh, has found that the ISO standard is one which is truly global and it's not constrained by any particular jurisdiction regulatory uh, law set uh, that it's universal and can be used for all different types of uh, uh, regulatory requirements for different types of laws. So as I alluded to, there's been too many regulatory requirements to juggle. It's been too costly to audit regulation by regulation and compliance without proof is potentially risk risky because you really you have to have a defensible set of evidence of artifacts and being able to make your case that you're really trying to exercise due care and due diligence to ensure that uh, you are ensuring data is secure and data is kept privacy, uh, private. Uh, the benefits of 27701 include they facilitate effective business agreements, they build trust and confidence in managing PII, that defines and clarifies roles and responsibilities, provides transparency for customers and stakeholders, supports and certifies, this is very important, compliance and various uh, privacy regulations and reduces complexity. So as I had mentioned here, uh, the French CNIL, who is one of the dominant data protection authorities, this past April 2nd had determined that uh, ISO 27701 is a global standard representing state-of-the-art and privacy protection. No other data privacy standards or framework uh, had gotten that type of uh, accolade and recognition. So it seems like um, since they're actually indicating that it can not only be used for GDPR, but in their opinion, that it's pertinent for Australia, Brazil, California, Canada, and other uh, regulatory jurisdictions. So um, ISO 27701, as it was mentioned, is an international standard. It defines the management system and security requirements for the processing of personal data and personally identifiable information. It's based on two information security standards and extends them to cover personal data protection. Uh, it relies on ISO 27001 and that provides certification of information security management and ISO 27002, which provides guidance to implement the necessary security measures. So one thing that has to be understood is really the two are, are complementary. That is to say that you can't become data privacy ISO 27701 certified unless you've received your information security certification for 27001. It'll become more clear, you'll see. 
So as mentioned, it's a prerequisite for uh, obtaining the ISO 27701 data privacy certification. And the two overlap. You can't have data privacy assurance unless you've got assurance that your information is secure. So here's an illustration where you have, again, 27001 uh, overlaps into 27701 for privacy. And although ISO 27701 data privacy standards are applicable to an array of data protection regulations, it should be noted that the certification is not synonymous with GDPR certification. The EU data protection authorities have not established any GDPR certification at this time, and that's as of uh, the end of Q2 uh, 2020. That said, an attested data privacy and information security compliance program with regular independent inspections provides the benefit of a defensible position during the GDPR related investigations and clarifications for ever increasing privacy laws, product and technological uh, enablement and more objective risk criteria for cybersecurity liability insurance policy underwriting. So it's important for all relevant data development stakeholders, I'm sorry, relevant for all software development stakeholders to be involved in determining the privacy impact risks, risk assessment applicable for software development lifecycle. So one of the important things that goes back to GRC is to ensure that an organization, including all their stakeholders, and where appropriate, the developer staff, uh, takes a look at the risks that may be uh, encountered in uh, the scope of the new application that's being developed. Um, are they cognizant of what the data flows are? Are they cognizant of uh, data retention? Uh, period requirements? Are they cognizant of any data subject rights uh, that might come into play, uh, intended use of that data, and how individuals are consenting and indicating their consent, uh, as well as uh, being able to allow a data subject where it's applicable to review, modify, and or request deletion of that data. So these are all considerations when uh, um, software is being developed. And that goes back to really following data privacy uh, by design. It's a philosophical framework. Uh, it's one in which there's seven principles where what you are is ensuring there's proactive and not reactive uh, data privacy, privacy as a default, and not something that has to be addressed uh, later on embedding data privacy into design, uh, that there's full functionality, uh, that there's uh, privacy enhances and doesn't degrade security and functionality, end-to-end -end security, full uh, life cycle protection, visibility, transparency, allowing individuals to understand uh, data use and privacy practices that are audited, and respecting user privacy to ensure that it's user-centric. Uh, to ensure data subject right protection. Uh, sorry, Jeff, just a quick comment here. We had someone from uh, the audience who suggested if you could put this into presentation mode uh, so they can read some of the text. Oh, certainly. Excuse me. Does that make it any easier? Uh, if you if you actually uh, yeah so yeah no and I'm sorry I'm having some problems with this particular release here <laughs> so, sure sure no problem okay so at any rate um, ISO two seven seven zero one open source data privacy uh, law control reference map uh, what Microsoft and MIT and a number of other consortium uh, uh, organizations have done is they have mapped the data privacy regulatory laws over to ISO 27701. So the advantage there is when an organization knows that, well, we are um, we are need to be compliant with CCPA and GDPR and maybe uh, Canada's PAPITA and so forth, you can actually map those regulatory legal requirements and their controls over to uh, what the controls are for 27701. So this makes things 
much easier from a standpoint of managing it from a data privacy compliance standpoint in-house and also your audit team. So that's, that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, feel free. Great, Jeff, if you can uh, stop sharing your screen, I'd like to go back to the diagram that we had. And what I'd like to do is uh, see if we can start to uh, have a conversation now about how we've got privacy and how it might be able to uh, intersect with uh, software development. So bear with me, I'm just going to share. Are you able to see my screen okay? Yes. Great. Uh, so in, in this discussion, you brought up several, several things. ISO 27001, 27002, uh, 27701, some regulations that are out there. We've got the whole GRC space, data governance. Any one of these topics could be a massive topic just on its own. Uh, and I'm just wondering, when we take a look at security, we've got DevOps at the center. We've got security as an overlay on top of this. Perhaps we can now start to extend the knowledge that exists today around security practices and start to see where privacy could come into this kind of a fast moving uh, DevOps cycle. Uh, so why don't we start with the, the GRC space? You, you had mentioned risk. And a lot of times when we are conducting our software development, the emphasis is all about pushing for the release. Uh, there's a lot of literature, there's a lot of technology, it's focused on automation, and the intent is to try and get the build out as quickly as possible. But what we're suggesting here is there needs to be some kind of a, a balanced development approach. We need to take a look at this from the perspective of privacy and security as we are going through the DevOps lifecycle. Can you talk a little bit from your experience about risk and what that means uh, as teams are, are kind of operating through the DevOps cycle? Because I think it touches on the 27002 standard as well a little bit. Have you seen anything that, that starts to bring risk and software development together insofar as, as um, the processes are concerned? Well, yes. So traditionally, risk management has taken a look at the chances of an event to occur or an incident to occur, which could turn into an event, and the impact uh, that uh, would result and affect the organization, usually negatively. Mm -hmm. In this particular instance, when we're talking about uh, risk management, um, the departure would be going into what happens to the data. So, GR, so GDPR requires a data uh, privacy, a data protection impact assessment to be made when an organization is rolling out an application, making a change to an application, anything that could potentially affect data subject rights uh, in instances where personal data is held in, let's say, a particular application. So one thing that would be very helpful is for an organization and their data development uh, project team to ensure that when they're talking about the initial build, and they're going through their change management, making revisions, uh, as well as on a regular basis from a monitoring standpoint, if there's many moving pieces, is to take a look at uh, data and how it's used. For instance, um, if the sales and marketing group um, see, of course, the value of retaining uh, individuals who might be subscribers or customers, and they're looking at expanding opportunity, uh, you'd have to ensure that any type of expansion of retention of that data, as well as broadening the data flows of that data uh, is reviewed as part of your, your code review, your change control. So again, that goes back into the whole uh, GRC, uh, that um, the governance team is ensuring that all applicable stakeholders are doing a risk assessment through doing mandatory DPIAs, uh, and that way to ensure that you're in compliance with whatever the appropriate regulatory uh, laws are. Yeah, and we've uh, oftentimes we find in our discussions when we start to focus on on things related to risk that uh, teams need to understand 
not just operational risk in terms of delivery, but also looking at what this means ultimately to a business. Um, and, and usually that'll come in the form of some kind of regulatory or compliance objectives or, or things like that, which, which I think, um, I mean, I, I wanted to jump into compliance, but you, you brought up this whole notion of data governance. Um, what does data governance have to do with software development, Jeff? Well, thanks for asking. And this is probably one of the most complex, most difficult topics and initiatives that medium to large organizations run into. And that is data governance has traditionally meant that there would be uh, executives who would be overseeing um, various data domains uh, and their owners, custodians, and stewards of data. And that gets into modeling. Again, it can be a very complex engagement to roll out data governance and to try to ensure that uh, uh, the data governance maps and domains and all the owners are properly uh, kept up to date. And that might really, again, back to an application book of record. But there's no way that you can ensure something um, such as data privacy uh, is going to be effective in data in uh, data software development, unless you've got a governance team who is discussing strategically uh, and tactically what data should be and what data flows to ensure that you're not inadvertently opening up the exposure of having personal data, personally identifiable data, where you didn't intend to, because that's where costly enforcement mistakes can occur. Yeah, that's interesting. It brings up the whole governance life cycle. So when we get into, for example, testing and we're doing testing, we want to make sure that we're uh, ensuring that from a governance standpoint, we're not leaking data inadvertently. We're not sharing information that should not be done. And I think what I've often seen as well is when it comes to the operational side as well, um, in operations, sometimes we deal with integrations. And as we look at data crossing uh, application boundaries, the uh, perimeters that we've got around privacy, uh, when we start to consider things like data lakes or data warehouses or things like that, suddenly uh, the risk in doing something like that becomes uh, much more like uh, much more pronounced and it's, it's considerable. And we have to think about how we're going to manage it from from that perspective. Um, when we when we deal with compliance. Can you, can you talk just briefly about compliance? We do have some of the standards that are out there. We also have perhaps some internal um, uh, best practices that we've got. Uh, from your perspective, putting a privacy lens on software development, is it possible to achieve a continuous compliance model as we go through this infinity DevOps model where we're constantly changing things? Yes, it is. And I'm glad you brought that up. So compliance is the driver. Everyone in an organization understands the necessity to ensure compliance. And the reason being is um, it can be very costly uh, to your brand. It can affect reputation, but most importantly, uh, regulatory enforcement uh, could end up uh, really be very expensive in the case of, let's say, GDPR and, and now possibly CCPA. So um, I have to say the development team, the development project team, would best have guidelines in which they're supposed to be ensuring they're asking whenever a new application is being built and whenever it's being tested if it could affect any other data, as you'd mentioned in data lakes, as it's in other containers and uh, um, databases, and as they're deploying it, and they would be ensuring that they're keeping track of the data flow uh, to make sure that personal data, personally identifiable information, isn't inadvertently um, migrating outside of what its intended use is. And ultimately, this is to prevent any type of external exposure of that data uh, that could then be picked up so that, let's say, in the case of a, a very large uh, enterprise with a myriad of different uh, products that it offers and suites, you can imagine what might happen if a data subject finds out as they're ready to register 
for um, a particular uh, new product or, or become a subscriber that their personal inf information, their personal information, their PII is already, is already there. They might be very well surprised. So again, compliance should be every step of the way, there should be key questions uh, that are appropriately asked of the development team when it comes to, again, building, and when it comes to changes, as well as deployments and uh, on a regular operational basis. Mm -hmm. And you and I had a conversation previously, uh, and I, I think it's, it's important to bring this out as well. When we talk about compliance, eventually we will run into auditability. Now, there are standards that are emerging. There are various frameworks that are out there. Can you speak to the auditability component of privacy at all? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, GDPR and other regulatory requirements, including many federal regulatory requirements, uh, really require that organizations ensure that their security controls and their data privacy controls are auditable. That is to say that they don't just rely on self-attestation. And the reason being is uh, self-attestation uh, really doesn't provide any type of independent assurance. Mm -hmm. what you say is occurring, uh, really is occurring. Uh, a lot of times self-attestation is seen as uh, binderware, so to speak. So um, ISO 27001, which has been widely used for the last at least 15 years, uh, has been the standard in which organizations are able to prove to their board as well as to uh, any of their investors that they have a good information security posture. And again, 27701, the ISO data privacy framework standards, that also is auditable and it's on top of ISO 27001 for information security. So I, I think I, I answered that. Um, the, the proper standard would be, again, auditable security controls and data privacy controls. Yeah, and I think it's important to bring out as well, uh, when considering any privacy framework, uh, looking at it from an auditability perspective, not just from uh, what might be a set of controls, but uh, ultimately, what are the things that an auditor might be able to come in and say, are we in fact doing this or not doing this? And one of the challenges that I've seen with a bunch of different standards um, that, that are applicable in a, in a given context is how do you begin to harmonize all of these? Uh, and it becomes difficult if you've got one uh, framework, for example, that is, uh, you know, really essentially a set of controls. And then you've got something that's being produced, for example, by ISO, which has uh, something that, that you shall and should be doing as an example, um, you know, and combine this with other frameworks that talk about maturity scales, for example, and it becomes somewhat complicated to try and uh, determine what should we be focusing on in helping the business reduce their risk. I think, at least from, from my perspective and what I'm seeing in the industry, this has been one of the challenges out there. And so you had mentioned 27701 as an effort to try to harmonize some of the various perspectives that are out there. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Are you seeing something similar as well, the need to, to kind of bring these together? Um, oh, you alluded to it, and that is, again, bringing it together, ensuring that there is a holistic approach within the organization to uh, not only uh, accommodate, but to abide by information security and data privacy standards. This is uh, at least ensuring there's a defensible position that an organization knows what its data flows are. Uh, it's been my experience with the GDPR enforcement authorities uh, that one of their top priorities and when they're doing an investigation is to take a look if the organization has been doing a data map, knows what its data flows are. Because what they found time and time again is um, other than when there's a data breach, an organization uh, really, the organizations have been doing the, uh, really not the best job when it comes to knowing uh, where informa personal information 
as well as uh, PII is flowing. So an organization that has a good, strong application book of record and whose development team uh, ensures uh, that they're keeping track where uh, types of data is going that might be vulnerable and might be subject to these, uh, these regulatory requirements, that's, that's really a very good place to start. Mm -hmm. And we hear a lot about shifting left, especially when we're dealing with, with development circles. And if we move this to the design stages and, and, and you know, we, we have this idea of a threat model and usually threat modeling is focused on what are the security implications of a given system? Uh, how, what are the vulnerabilities? Um, what are the recommended mitigations? And now we almost have to start to inject some additional perspectives into this. We've got to start to take a look at it from a privacy standpoint. Where might we have data leakage? Where might integrations potentially uh, lead to uh, information getting into another system and bypassing the necessary access controls, as an example? Uh, and so there's a, a data governance element to it, which touches on the threat modeling. But as we look at, at, at how we begin to evolve threat modeling, Historically, the idea of having a data flow diagram focused exclusively on security, I think, is, is expanding to also include um, areas around privacy. Uh, but, but now the, the question is, how do we move away from a manual approach and start to take a look at this idea that we want to get into an automated way of doing this because we're moving very quickly now? And so one of the trends that we've observed is while threat modeling as a diagrammatic kind of approach can be useful, uh, it's, it's almost shifting now towards being policy driven at this point. Uh, and and you, know, you talked about standards, you talked about how when we look at data governance, um, there's an element of oversight involved with that, which is more about being repeatable and something that we can take and we can push through the entire life cycle as we're uh, constructing our software here. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, this notion of policy-driven development? Uh, we're seeing it in security circles. Are you seeing policies being pushed as requirements from the business side now into uh, the early stages of software development and then being carried through all the way? Well, yeah, so there are uh, some organizations in the data governance arena and data management arena that do accommodate uh, data privacy um, control requirements, for instance, and you could call it automation. But when you're talking about data development, uh, again, the key word is development. And I'm thinking about individuals who at the architectural and execution level can change code or can build code that will be manipulating personal data. So I, I'd have to say it's hard to really see where automation comes into play uh, when we're strictly talking about uh, software development. Uh, but from the standpoint of uh, data privacy compliance, uh, again, my point of view would be, again, a holistic and integrative approach would be to ensure that the development group has the appropriate rules of what should be done and what shouldn't be done with personal data, ensuring that any type of alteration of that data flow, including sharing it with third parties where there may be uh, business agreements of uh, sharing individuals' data as even part of a, a privacy agreement, uh, that there is an awareness of once that data moves from its intended use, now you're really exposed to violating data subject rights and getting into some significant trouble. And again, that appears to be more of a, a manual approach until you automate all of your third party relationships with data brokers and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you're touching on something as well when we look at complex supply chain relationships as an example. And now we've got data potentially that's being shared across a number of suppliers. Um, have you seen anything uh, in the industry to, to help uh, when it comes to dealing with supply chain? I mean, I've certainly seen things when it's related to security. And supply chain security is a big thing now, especially when we're dealing with uh, 
uh, you know, critical infrastructure and, and things like that. But what about, uh, what about from a, from a privacy standpoint? Um, can we instill some kind of a standard or some kind of a policy that would extend across the supply chain, as an example? Is that even feasible in your experience? Well, it's potentially feasible, but ultimately it gets down to the individual agreements, opting in, opting out at an organizational level about how data will be shared with other suppliers and what type of monetary uh, compensation might be provided uh, for enabling uh, their use of that data. There is vendor risk, um, vendor risk agreement and vendor risk databases that are available from privacy management organizations whereby which vendors are uh, attesting to their security posture and updating it on a continual basis to ensure that organizations can keep up with their third party uh, vendor risk management. But from a privacy standpoint, uh, uh, again, I really, other than the fact that someone may attest that they happen to have a data privacy officer and that they do uh, regular application uh, security and privacy reviews, ultimately, I don't readily see uh, any particular standard for this at this particular point in time. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Well, uh, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Let's see if we've got some questions from folks at all. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, some stuff in Q&A. Uh, so one question is, uh, can you please define what ABC means preceded by vulnerability correlation? Uh, absolutely. So uh, when, we, when we are uh, developing applications, uh, usually what we want to do is uh, there's an opportunity to go in and to construct mappings that exist uh, between vulnerabilities. Uh, so we can talk more about that. Um, I think uh, if you've got any questions, uh, by all means, we can have a follow-up discussion. I would uh, like to keep the discussion focused on sort of the privacy element of this and, and what we might do. But when we look at, at correlations, that's where the, the angle of that comes in. Uh, the second question is ALM integration have not seen before. Uh, so when it comes to yeah, application lifecycle management, we sometimes call these issue tracking systems in a DevOps context. Uh, we usually find that when dealing with um, uh, 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 DevOps teams, that usually they need some way to be able to orchestrate the work that they're doing. And that's where uh, application lifecycle management comes in. Uh, please do keep the questions coming as well if there's anything else that you want uh, to ask us at this point. Um, Jeff, just a couple of uh, uh, other points. I think we're coming up close to concluding this webinar, but uh, just general broad trends. If you can talk about what you're seeing uh, insofar as uh, your perspective on the convergence of privacy with security and software development and how far you think this is going to go. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so I'd say I think most organizations really are understanding that if they don't have a handle of data privacy uh, to ensure compliance in the initial software development, that it's gonna be very difficult to address later on. It's tough enough right now with having any type of applications that are legacy from other vendors or developed in house to address that after the fact. So even though this is very new for a lot of development teams, you have to at least have these discussions so that when, again, you're talking about data flows and the way data will be used and where it'll be stored and how long will it be stored and so on. Uh, I think that there is really growing appreciation uh, for tackling this. And again, it, it goes back to data governance and uh, having a strong C-suite that understands that if you don't tackle these items um, during software development, uh, they're just going to exacerbate things later on as your environment becomes more complex. Yeah, so therein lies, I think, the importance of, of moving forward now, even in the standards groups that we're involved with. Privacy is definitely becoming uh, more and more 
of, of, a, of a point of discussion. Standards are evolving around this. Uh, and this is also moving forward to begin to consider um, ethical norms and considerations that are a superset of security and privacy as well. So if anything, we're going to be building on top of this within the industry. And I think when we look at it from a developer or a development lifecycle perspective, the, uh, the thought is we need to become more aware of these things. We need to start to consider how we can inject these earlier on in the life cycle so that it's not bolted on at the end and perceived as an additional cost, uh, which will slow down teams from deploying, which is what is really important from an execution standpoint for a particular business context. Um, I think as well, when, when I see the industry and the move towards digitalization, uh, the idea that we are uh, trying to move quickly and, and the, the, the integrations that we've got um, across different organizations and how even that can be just momentary and then we shift over and we might reintegrate with something else. Privacy becomes really important as we consider the governance aspect of what you were talking about as well, Jeff. Um, we need to think about the various cases and, and what the nuances are now and what that means from a developer's perspective, not just not just for the, 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 the current release, but what do we now think about it from a longer term perspective uh, as, as an overall strategy on how we're going to inject privacy into uh, what is now deemed to be a, a critical process, um, i.e. software development lifecycle inside an enterprise at this point. Uh, so if there are any other questions, please do continue to ask us. We'd be more than happy to answer those questions. Um, one question that's come up here, what is the best way to integrate privacy by design and ISO 27001? Privacy by design is often criticized as being too broad, while ISO audit controls aren't necessarily agile for a DevOps model. Jeff, any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, yeah. so Judy, thank you for asking this question. You're absolutely right. Privacy by design and its seven principles are very broad. And the reason why is they're principles and, and not necessarily anything that could be put into controls at that particular level. They're not granular enough. And uh, again, um, I share with your, uh, your opinion about uh, ISO as well, that they aren't necessarily agile enough for a DevOps model. But they're what we have currently, and the good news is privacy by design and its principles, uh, you don't have to abide by those uh, as much as guidelines if you're using ISO 27701 data privacy framework standards uh, that have their own control. So that gives you a bit more granularity. And again, it's very complementary to the ISO information security standard. Um, this is always a challenge. When you're dealing with development, uh, it's very difficult to uh, get your, your code builders to really tackle uh, the requirements of these security and data privacy control standards. But at least it has to be a topic for discussion and consideration when, again, it, it occurs to the what happens during the personal data life cycle from creating the personal data to storing it to modifying it, managing it, uh, as well as retrieving it and deleting it. So that's what we have to go with at this particular point in time. And, and these um, auditable security and data privacy controls are really um, the best guidance we have at this time. Great, thanks, Jeff. Uh, okay, so I think uh, there doesn't seem to be any more uh, questions. Uh, what I'll do is I'll hand it over now to you, Raquel. And uh, just as well, that one hanging question, uh, which is really more around security, um, I will do a follow-up. I'll reach out to the uh, attendee that asked the, that question, just to make sure that, that you've got um, the, uh, the, the appropriate response that you're looking for. Uh, but having said that, uh, Raquel, I'd like to hand it over to you now uh, for conclusion. Thank you. Sorry about that. So thank you so much, Altaz and Jeff. Thank you again for a great session. Uh, just to let everybody know, we do have webinars lined up for the next few weeks. So if you're interested in attending any of these, 
please go to the upcoming events and webinar section of our website to sign up. Uh, we hope everyone found this presentation insightful. And again, we will be providing a link to every one of the recordings to this webinar uh, via email. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day. Stay well and safe. And thank you very much.